So if anyone's got a couple of questions for Andy, um, no, um, he will be on the panel. Um, so if there's any couple of quick fire questions. Um, Andy, you're saying you farmers should take the leap of faith and share their data, but is there a value? Should farmers be paid for the data? Because presumably it's got value to other people as well. How do you assess the value of data to the people that may be not so very pleased to receive it? Com completely, it's got a value. And for me, it's just about finding that win win. You know, the value for the farmer <coughs> isn't the data, the data necessarily, it's the insight that it's giving the farmer and allowing them to make better decisions as a result of it. If the fact that that can be used by wider agricultural professionals and organisations, and the farmer gets some form of kickback or reward for doing so, even better. I might pass that one as well. Jim, it's a good point. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room today saw our headline and were like, oh my God, farmers are going to make a million pounds a year from data and everything else. But, but why should they be willing to share with third parties, you know, in, in the sense of, you know, what is in it for them? Um, well, I, I guess, I mean, data in, in itself is, um, is of limited value, I would say, um, to any farmer. If you can't organise it and you can't, add value to it and you can't enrich it uh, and you can't model it and you can't get to the holy grail which is really predictive analytics for agriculture if you can't do those things um, then it is farm data on its own is all limited value uh, and i guess um, but it's as andy has very eloquently said it, it is the insight from the data it's the it's the derived value it's the um, it's it's what you do with the data that, that, that has the value. And I guess, I mean, one of, one of the things we are here to announce today um, is that we are, um, we're very keen, philosophically, to see that that derived data um, that flows off the farm, um, the farmer captures some of the value that, that that data will have to the industry. But it's ultimately the industry which has the big, the big data science uh, and, and I guess our vision is that if we can put all of you together in the same room, um, then you have massive opportunities to add value, not only at farm level, but at industry level. Um, how, would look, how would it look, though, Jim, in the I suppose, you know, and potentially when will it be rolled out? You probably have that question. Okay. Um, I, we are thinking very much in terms of uh, farmers receiving. Um, financial reward for sharing data based on how much data, how much they're prepared to share um, but the key to it is it's going to be more in the style of think of a farmer uh, data cooperative so it will be farmer owned farmer controlled um, and farmers will have the opportunity to decide who gets to see their data and who doesn't get to see their data so this whole area of transparency and ownership has to be absolutely clear. And, and we, we sincerely <coughs> believe that over the next 10 to 20 years, we need to get way ahead of the curve in terms of you know, the Facebooks and the Googles. Let, let's not get ourselves. It's farmer data. The primary data belongs to the farmer. But if you share it with the industry and allow them to add massive value through data science, then the potential is immense. Um, I've got a question for Clive. <clears throat> um, obviously, you've had a, a phenomenal year going around the country with Happy <coughs> Hector and celebrating, you know, which was fantastic, great news story. But where do you see, you know, farm data? How can it improve from farmers? You know, you're farming yourself, you build your business, you know, on the back of providing insight and data and everything else. Where do you see it? Going? It's, it's a real challenge. I mean, data data is growing exponential. Um, there isn't there's hardly anything we can get this day in age on the farm that isn't connected one way or another, or has a, another reading or a digital readout. And, and to be quite honest, I think a lot of farmers are, 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 are just truly overwhelmed with the amount of data they've got in all the different packages. And trying to get these data systems to, to really link together, where you can put the data into a useful place where you don't have to remember <coughs> the passwords to log into different things that tell you you've used the wrong one and when you put another one in it's the same one you had last time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really frustrating. And, and, and as people that work with data and try and help farmers interpret data, 
the challenge we have in getting day job farmers in a timely fashion so we can make those informed decisions when you've got the data, when you need the data, so it can add the real value, it's a real challenge. So I think, I think there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity with data, uh, but it does have to become much simpler from the farmer perspective and, and less siloed and, and, and more joined up. And that's what I think is really exciting about the opportunities within macroagriculture. How farmers can be in control of that data, permission that data, and, and allow that, that independence of their data to be shared with where they want it to be in a good way. Do you see it? You know, is it country specific or is it just about you know, what do you see to share data? I know you were in India recently. I'm just interested for, for a bit. No, I think it doesn't matter what scale of farmer you are, whether you're a smallholder farmer in India, Africa, or, or anywhere, you've got to make the right decisions. Uh, and making timely informed decisions when it needs to be made is, is irrelevant of the size or scale of the farm or where you find. Any questions? There was a, a lady with a red jacket that caught my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great advantage of wearing a red jacket. I think, I think it probably is also worth thinking about the value of short-term data versus long-term data which can benefit the industry. I have an academic background and if I think about how medicine is advanced from the long-term epidemiological studies which have gone on for 20, 30, 40 years and I think that needs to be put into this equation as well because clearly the short-term data which is going to help farmers and make needed business decisions but we also need to think about how we utilize that data in the very long term to make the right evidence-based decisions for the industry. I would fully agree. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think we forget a lot about how we've got to where we've got to today. Um, somebody, somebody was telling me about history and we should learn our history. Uh, and I think our memories are getting shorter and we forget too quickly these days because we, we're overwhelmed with information. Uh, I really think we're on, the, on a, a real transition where data is going to have an implication in the play and the way our countryside might look and the way we farm. Uh, and while I'm slightly biased for what we might do in, in hands-free hectare uh, and where robotics might take agriculture, if you start thinking about the bigger picture where we may be in a few years' time or ten years' time, it could transform the way we actually farm altogether. <coughs> Uh, I took a lot of inspiration uh, in, in the travels that, that I did into Mexico when I used to work for the government in how they were growing two crops at the same time in the same field and getting three quarter yields from each of them. Uh, and while we might think as farmers we've got to get 100% yield, it really opened my eyes to the concept that but if you grow two crops at the same time and get one and a half yields, surely that's better off to you as a farmer than it is having one at, at the best it can be and it has to be. If you can hedge your bets and do different things and having the right analysis with data and technologies to question and understand that, I think really opens up a lot of opportunities and really will change thinking and behaviours. It's going to require some serious sort of thinking around the whole ownership of that data and which is anonymised and goes into the longer term sort of database. Absolutely. But if a farmer can permission where his data is used, how it's used yeah. and who has access to it, I think that is fundamental. Uh, the farm has to be in control. And it's completely traceable. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. I think there was a gentleman just there. Sorry, I caught you. Yeah. No, I'm behind you. Um, how, how far away are you from um, linking to the compliance side of agriculture, particularly governmental intervention uh, and the provision of, uh, say, natural capital services? How is that going to link into the matter of agriculture? <laughs> data set? I can have a go with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, sh the short answer is we are some way off that one. That, 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 that's what we're doing. Um, however, uh, I, I think I'm going to have this one to try. This is a fast time, but uh, no, certainly there are more and more things you can do uh, with remote sales in terms of um, um, natural capital uh, and even things like depth of uh, top soil. So um, I, I, I think that's a, that's a real biggie, and it may take you know, some time to achieve. But if you can find Forbes Elworthy after this, he, he'd be the guy to really put that one in front of him. Um, I just want to ask James a question. All around, if you do a lot of work, let's say, on the supply chain, the farms, you know. How do you see farming data helping the whole supply chain? Because you know, at the end of the day, you've got people that are consuming food, they're selling, buying, 
yesterday that people are going to produce more boldly. Maybe so there's a lot of challenges happening in a short data, especially in the livestock sector. And how do you see it evolving? Well, the, the area that we most been involved with has been milk production, but the question I think that we have to ask farmers is um, the product you're producing, who are you selling it to? Um, is it if it's milk or if it's uh, grain or if it's meat? Um, who is the customer? Um, and I think one of the things that um, a lot of people would say was, well, it's the person who's actually buying that person who goes into the supermarket, the person who's in the kitchen cooking their meals. But actually, we would contend perhaps that it would be the retail market, so the, the people that are stocking their shelves, whether it's um, Sainsbury's or Tesco's or Waitrose or even uh, McDonald's, uh, they will have, they will create and define the spec that they want. Uh, and unless the farmers are actually producing a product that conforms with the spec that they require, then you're not going to be as, as competitive. So, you know, I don't think when farmers say, well, I can produce milk or I can produce uh, grain like and plug it on the open market, they're not realizing the full potential for that crop. Um, and what we've seen more and more is you may have a contract to produce milk and that milk maybe will have to have a certain quality, um, whether that's butter fat, or protein, whatever, or even looking at some of the schemes you see on the continent, looking at defined levels of fatty acids. And that quality, the, the data that defines the quality is becoming, is becoming more and more important because it will set you apart from the competition. So I think you know, those quality aspects and getting data that <coughs> refers to the product that you are producing and conforms with what people are asking for, I think that's the, the crucial question that we need to answer. Nick, I know you raised your hand. Thanks, JP. Um, in, in the pre-digital world, and I'm certainly old enough to remember that, uh, <laughs> Many players in the food supply chain held data information for their own particular advantage, their own economic advantage, banks, retailers, um, agents, traders, and on and on, pharmacy even sometimes. And many of them, and occasionally correctly, felt that the lack of transparency played to their advantage. In, in a world that's becoming bigger in terms of the volume of information that's potentially there, but also much more transparent, uh, who do you see as the likely winners and losers um, in that supply chain, in managing the data and having access to it? Um, well, the, the, the short answer to that one is, is if farmers are the winners of this new transparency, then map of has actually failed. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, um, that is central to our, our, our whole um, vision. I mean, there are there is still a lot of data out there that is held about farmers, <coughs> with or without your permission, uh, and, and that is just that is just how it is. Um, but but it, you know, we believe that in the 21st century, um, you know, there'll be two kinds of company. There will be those that were sharing their information for the good of the improvement of farming and those that didn't, because they won't be with us anymore. <laughs> um, so, so I haven't really answered your question, Nick, but, 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 but uh, I guess what I'm saying is our vision is that farmers should share in the derived value from this data. And if, if that doesn't happen, then it's not going to work anyway. Uh, Jim, let's trade that one in. Clearly there's more than one organization in this space uh, how does the farming industry know which horse to back? Uh, are you going to collaborate or are you competing? And if so, how? Um, well, I've always found myself collaboration works best. And I think from our point of view, we're happy to talk to anyone. Because the way we see it is <coughs> living in a silo is not going to work anymore. You know, if you think you've got the competitive advantage by keeping everything to yourself, you're not. Look, I go back up to the slide, blockbusters, prime example. They're not around anymore because somebody thought of a better, more efficient way of doing it. So either decide to club together and help each other to get better and get more out of it, or to be honest, I think, you know, putting your, your arm around it and protecting it. Don't get me wrong, there's certain pieces of information that you should do, but so long as you're permissioning it and you know where it's going, or to what people, or what 
resources, whether it be a revisor or, or further up the supply chain to your process. Or, um, I think that's the piece you're saying is that, you know, take control and work with people. So yeah, we're happy to talk to anyone um, and discuss the way forwards. Um, and we already have a couple of kind of joint venture bits and pieces happening, so that's good. Yeah, um, so when Bobby Bernardi is his data in his own farm, that's obviously him using his data directly to help himself, but in terms of your business, do you see it as more important to have individuals using their data to directly help them, or sharing their data for you to sort of build a picture of a whole industry to help Both. them help? Both is a strong answer, because um, we will commercialise the use of the data and pay a proportion of the rewards from that, Back to the farming, back to farmers for sharing their data. So, so the whole business, you know, this platform will be free to farmers, um, and you will decide who you share that information with. But the way the business model works is, uh, it's all about sharing data with the wider industry, and that's all the way from you know, the input suppliers all the way through to the customer, the end consumer. And for me, what I liked about at the bank's vision is about finding that win-win, you know, giving data better access to their farm, giving their farmer data to make, you know, more informed decisions, but also helping the wider industry through <coughs> bringing that, that data together. A lot of, every farm business is obviously so different, how do you sort of depend from not using so many different vehicles, how long is it? We're kind of agnostic about uh, benchmarking. We, we leave that to the what we call the last mile experts. You know, there's no point in us trying to disrupt you know, those amazing relationships that have gone on for 20 or 30 years with the vet or the agronomist or uh, the bank manager. Our view is, or our mission if you like, is to put the data into those people's hands so they can decide you know, whether it's worth um, you, know, you benchmarking what you're doing against another farmer. Well, you can decide share your information with the farm next door or three other farmers in the same valley. Um, because our experience of benchmarking is on the whole, most farmers I know don't believe it. Because they always they will always excuse themselves. They will always say, ah oh, yes, but the reason I'm here and he's there is because uh, it's not like that on our farm. <laughs> and, and that's fine. That's that's your prerogative. So for me benchmarking only really, really works when it's put together by those last mile professionals who are comparing you with like similar clients. But I think you could start in some ways and say just benchmark yourself. If you're capturing data and it's a source of truth, you can't say that the TH is being Irish, but uh, you know that source of truth of information, you can see where was it six months ago, three months ago. I mean James, you've experienced that mm -hmm. which some of your clients should I think on I disagree with Jim a little bit about benchmarking because it depends on some of the parameters you look at. For us, if we're looking at things like, say, clinical mastitis or cell cancer or whatever, and it's very strictly defined, you, know, you define exactly what you mean by case of mastitis, what is a high cell count, what is a normal cell count, and you feed that data back to farmers, and especially certain fertility data, and we've seen in a big scheme that we've run for a long time now, that by doing that, they give the farmers their own data, and also showing where they are in the big picture. If you go on farm as a consultant, you can say, you're brilliant for that, 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 and that, but you're not very really good at that. Look at where you are compared with the rest of the group. So I, I think from an animal health point of view, it can be really, really effective to make sure, as long as you pick the right parameters uh, and you make sure they're very straight with the definitions. It's very, farms are quite competitive. You want, to, you want to see where you are and get better. Yeah, I guess just to excuse my, myself for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about whole business benchmarking rather than uh, individual KPIs. Me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. David Plan and Metrics, so we're really government, we should back in David Plan's platform, and they'll make a boost out there. So a lot of this is music to my ears, it's really good music, I don't know, it's a long time. And I think this is really significant, but I think there are several aspects of it. You're making a very important first step. So I think the point you made, JP, about other industries is also clear. And if you look at the analysis of those other industries, the people that came in absolutely whack work from those industries. And so I would suggest that people quite sort of semi rhetorical questions. A, the technology is good. So this technology is good, it isn't scalable. 
And B, I think I absolutely completely concur it has to be quick for a win win. But other sectors, Lady in the Red mentioned about the medical sector. Genome England, you know, 100,000 genomes, you could probably work out one of them in mind if you really wanted to. But there's lots and lots of insights come out of that from people from outside the sector. So I think in terms of positioning going forward, what can really help the sector is clever people coming outside and doing interesting things with bits of data that you haven't thought of and put it together. I once went to, I've been in big data for the very sectors. I went to a talk by one of the founders of big data, and he was asked what the definition of big data is. And originally in computer we were saying like, you know, more data than one computer system and one program can handle in one place. But he said that's rubbish. It's actually answering questions you haven't even thought of. And I think I think what you outlined today has been a really important significant step and if people don't take it on board, they're going to put it on the But I think taking it further forward is what you said. I agree with you, Carmen. One of the I think one of the fantastic things we've done is that we've brought a lot of people in from outside agriculture. So I'm a farmer, I'm a, you know, farming at home, but I still <coughs> sit alongside somebody that's never even been on a farm or up to the last home that was on a farm. So they're coming and looking at data from a completely wide uh, you know, angle. And I know Jim and his team you know, are starting to really learn a lot from people just looking at agricultural data but don't, don't know what mastitis means, but just looks at numbers. Yeah, just quick, so same for my team. I was in ag, then I was in biotech for years, and now I've come back into ag for five years. I give advice at the business school. And as a woman there, it's found a company, Indian, very clever, went across 10 years at Amazon, came back to, came to the UK to build an ag business, even though no ag background, which seems ag. But our, but our whole philosophy is all about, you know, there is no monopoly of truth or knowledge. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and if we don't share, then we won't make farming better. Absolutely. And if we don't make farming better, then there won't be farming in this country. <coughs> Absolutely. Especially after you know, what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've actually not mentioned it so far, in <laughs> Well, we've got, we've got a few minutes. Yes. How much does the success of this depend on reliable and fast broadband? Ah, good, good question. Like that. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I mean, data is worthless if you can't use it and get it where it needs to be used. So, so having decent connectivity is something that is a real challenge when it comes to, to making informed decisions. And depending whether you're looking at near term decisions or long term decisions, uh, and how accurate you need to be. Communications are one of the biggest problems. If we can overcome the communication barrier to transferring data, and we can make the farmer's life a lot easier because we don't mess around with memory sticks or data transfer mechanisms that tend to be manual. If there's a manual uh, input to that, then it generally gets screwed up one way or another, or a doggy into a memory stick, or with the uh, other, you leave it in your cows and your wife washes it, which regularly happens with mine. Um, you know, it, it can be a real problem, and you can lose some really valuable insights. <coughs> it's fundamental. We've been working on different projects for, for two or three years, uh, looking at farm connectivity and how we can improve that. We we're playing with altitude balloons to try and transfer data back to the roads and farms. We're doing the same with 5G projects. We've got a number of use case scenarios at the moment where we're looking to transfer data straight from sensors uh, to, to control machines in different areas of the field so that insight can come from different areas with that combined network. Um, with 5G particularly to, to really drive the amount of data and challenge the amount of data that, that we can really move in the process. So, so connectivity is, is absolutely vital uh, to make sure that we can make the informed decisions on the time scales we want to do that. And if there's one thing that uh, the government could show some leadership on, it would be in that area. <laughs> because that would transform the rural economy in more than just farming. <clears throat> Sounds like you're already thinking of solutions as if that's not going to happen, though. Yeah, try it, but it's fine. We probably have time for about two more questions. The gentleman back there. Is there an appetite from tech providers to standardise data and make it easier for different systems to talk to one another at home that you've got a lot of room with your father that doesn't stop you? There is, but that has its own challenges. So, so if we think about standards, you know, starting to think a little bit potentially towards legislation. Standards generally are far too slow coming out. And the way technology is changing and the pace technology is changing within agriculture particularly, as soon as you've got a standard, you'll have another sensor that's got more information, that's delivering more insight, that doesn't fit the standard, and it doesn't fit. 
So, so having accurate data and having the ability to get that data in, into the platform where you need it is more important, I think, than, than having a data standard as such. The end user of the data needs to understand how they're interpreting that and where that data is coming from. And that isn't something that we should really push or, or shove down people's throats. You need to understand where your data has come from, how it's collected, and make sure that you're benchmarking it or using it in the, in the framework that you think is important. Right, we'll have one. <coughs> I've got one question. Sorry, did anyone else have a question at the back? I've got one question left. Andy, you're always very positive, so it's welcome to you. It's nice to sit every on and off in a positive spin. We've got um, something around the corner. I think I'm going to mention it. You might have all do a lot about that. But actually, what's more worrying for me is all the talk about emissions, sustainability, farming. You know, to me, that's a bigger challenge than, than the keyboard. You know, how do, you, do you really see data, technology, helping your farm to shape that future? You know, yeah, I think I'd probably go back to my presentation and say that we've got a, a data problem or a data challenge. You know, with the, the Brexit, the, uh, the looking at how you become more sustainable, it's got to be an opportunity. And, and like you said, right at the beginning of the talk, farming has changed and it has embraced technology as it's changed. We need to continue to do that. I mean, you know, change isn't easy for a lot of farmers, but if you embrace change and, and look at the new technologies that are out there, they can help with your business, make them more efficient, make them more profitable, and enjoy what you're doing. For me, and I suppose really, the industries that I've been involved in prior to agriculture, they were very positive, you know? And, and the first meeting I went to, coming back into agriculture, it was the same farmers moaning about the mill price. You know? For me, it's about, you know, let's embrace change and let's be positive about our industry. You know, we can't affect the likes of Brexit, but, but let's deal with what, what's thrown at us and, and let's be positive about our industry. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I'd like to thank you all for turning up this morning. Enjoy the rest of your conference. And, you know, wish you all the best for 2019. I think massive opportunities out there. But for God's sake, will you please start working with data and stop talking about it and collaborate. And, and